Hello everyone, and welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Robotics Arena. Today's video is on model-based control of humanoid walking, and our guest is Brian Kim. So he's put together some pretty nice examples on starting with a simple model and going all the way to a 3D simulation of a walking robot. So let's talk about those two things. So, so what is this simple model that we start with typically when working with humanoid robots? Yes, so the simple model is the linear inverted pendulum. And instead of modeling the entire robot's uh, complex dynamics uh, with all the contacts and the, the legs and whatnot, it's actually better in this case to have a simpler model to make the robot follow the trajectory of the model. Yeah, so then basically the way it works is that your whole mass of your robot, you assume it's concentrated on this, basically the, the bob of the pendulum, and then the pendulum is hinged about where it's positioned its foot, Yes. and then it just right. will fall forward, and then at some point you put your foot down elsewhere, that kind of right, puts the pendulum in a different place, mm -hmm. and then you just kind of keep falling as you're following your trajectory. Yes. So that, that's kind of how, walking in a way, how people falling. walk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, walking is falling. Yeah. So to get from this simple model, what are the steps that you need to get to actually implementing controls mm -hmm. on an actual articulated walking robot? So what we are going to do is find a piece of trajectory that we will use it to create the pattern. And once we do, we're going to transform the reference frame. So once we have the body trajectory, we want the trajectory of the feet. And once we have the trajectory of the feet, we want to find the trajectory of the joints. And this is going to be a six degree of freedom legs. So we want to find the trajectory of its six joints. So once we check that everything is as we expected, we'll put in the Simulink model and see how it actually works on the actual robot. Okay, so now let's dig into the first couple steps of doing this walking pattern. I guess let's assume that your walking pattern is made up of a bunch of different pieces where you put your foot down in one place and then you fall forward and then another place and then you take another footstep and do it over again. Right. The control logic, really. In this case, we are placing the next foot at the, the mirror location. Right, so it would be kind of like that. Yes. And I think this works in this case because in our example, we're just walking straight. Right, so for the X, uh, we're coming back to the original position to go in the straight line. But at the same time, for the Y direction, you're moving at a step length. Yep. So we are also making it into a symmetric piece, yep. a slice. And since we already know this initial condition is going to give that symmetric piece of trajectory, we're simply using the, the mirroring to uh, as the control logic here. Yep. And then there's more advanced ways to basically walk in not a straight line, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, this is just a very simplified model, but in the Khajiit test paper, they use the optimization to find the next foothold, so Y position. There's also the idea of capture point, and you can utilize it to guide where the pendulum is going to move in the in the next direction. So yeah, let's take a look. So inside the LIPM folder, there's the application. So yeah, so the app is to describe how the model moves around. So for a given initial condition, we want to see how, how things move around uh, with the linear inverted pendulum. Right. So what we have here is we kind of set a few parameters, right? We set the height of the pendulum and the simulation time. And then what we want to do is play around with the initial X and Y positions and velocities to see if we can get something that looks like a stable walking pattern, right? I think you know how the numbers work a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So now we get a general idea of how the, the pendulum moves. Uh, it's kind of like planet moving around. Yeah. Uh, so they do actually call it orbit, and there's the idea of well, orbital energy. So looking here, we can see the trajectory of the pendulum, and we can try different numbers to see what the difference is like. All right. And then you can see by reducing the, the initial speed, how uh, that affects, in this case, so depending on how far you started from and how fast you started, it's going to have a different trajectories. Right. So then if we go back to the two-dimensional plot here, then there's no coincidence that the default one that you chose, so the middle one, that was the one that looked the most symmetric in terms of like the starting and ending position. Whereas, you know, you're probably pretty likely to fall with the other two trajectories in this case. 
right. if you kind of tried to piece them together. Right. Or at least it'd be good for turning in one direction or the other. Actually, yes. So you do want to find the good working trajectories for your robot to follow because obviously if it goes too far, it's, it's not going to work for the actual robot. Okay, so now we got to put these together in, in a pattern where we keep alternating footsteps, right? So then we have a script that kind of does this stitching of the patterns based on those initial conditions. Now that we have a, a, our own robot model, if we just kind of scroll through a little bit, um, here we've got our, our actual parameters, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you have the robot height and how high you want the robot to move around, which is the Z model. Yeah, because you need to always walk at a, at a certain height, you need to pick up a, a lower and that's why these robots always walk with their knees bent. Right. So our pendulum is going to be at the height of, of here of 0.68 meters. And then as we're swinging our feet, we just chose a parameter where we're swinging uh, 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters, right? Right. So we just want to make sure the swing foot dynamics doesn't affect the walking too much. Right. And then kind of as we keep scrolling through then, here are the, the magic initial conditions. So this is where we were stitching things together for that symmetric pattern where we're walking forward in a straight right. line. So in this case, I found out that this set of initial conditions, those uh, happen to be good initial conditions for the symmetric pattern. Yeah. And then you can either just kind of guess all those by guess and check, or you've also offered here an alternative where we can parameterize it a little bit by saying, here's the length of the step we want to take and the speed kind of at the peak of the swing and then you can figure out what these initial conditions are yes. based on that. So in the find initial conditions function, yeah. I actually use the idea of orbital energy to make the symmetric pattern. All right, so let's just run this. As you see here, you basically have this symmetric walking trajectory where the main thing of that, that curve that you see there is going to be the trajectory of your center of mass that's swinging left and right, and, and you want that to keep oscillating about the midpoint of whatever trajectory you're following. And right, then at the right. bottom, you have your, your foot placements. Mm -hmm. So you've got your left foot and your right foot, and they're, mm -hmm. as they should be, they're constantly alternating. Mm -hmm. um, so, right, those are the swing foots that you yeah. want to make sure as you're moving the body forward, one foot will be the plan, on the ground will be moving your body, yeah. and at the same time, you want your swing foot to move to the next plan position. So then I also noticed one interesting thing at the very start of the walking pattern, that that first step that you took there is a little bit smaller, and you, there, there's like a, a little period at the beginning there where it wasn't quite following the trajectory. So this is something pretty right. important that you right. have to take care of, right? Actually, yeah. For the actual robot, it will be standing still at first. It would not have the initial conditions that would be set in the beginning. Yeah. So to go into that pattern, what I'm adding uh, is to move the body a little lower. Yeah, so first you started in what you call the double support phase, right? So you have both your feet on the ground and you're moving from the upright position down to the, the height of that you want to keep walking at. And then we take a half step to go to that starting position. Yeah. And then the idea is that if you kind of tune that right, then you're geared up to then continue walking in this right. trajectory. Right, and once you reach that, you can just make the pattern so you can do the same thing full step, step after step. Okay, so we have a trajectory that tells us where our center of mass is going to be moving and where we're going to be putting our feet. So which one is the anchor foot, which one is the swing foot. But we need to convert this to something that the robot can actually follow with its actuators. So what you really want is, since the robot is going to move your feet, we are going to translate the, the trajectory that we just got and then change it into the trajectory of the feet. And once we do get the trajectory of the feet, we're going to use that trajectory to generate the trajectory of the joints using inverse kinematics. So yeah, so if the left foot is the plant foot and it's moving the body uh, at the same time, the right foot, which is the swing foot, will be moving its leg from its initial position to the next position where it will be the, the next plan. So let's see how we've done this in Malib. So we are going to go back to the script and change the trajectory of the robot in terms of the trajectory of the feet. You basically took the absolute world positions of the center of mass, the left foot and the right foot, and you just basically made the two feet positions relative to a coordinate frame. It's local to the center of mass of the robot. Right. You're kind of making the assumption that your center of mass is always going to be moving at the right trajectory it's supposed to. Right. Um, I guess in reality, you'd probably need to check if you're well on trajectory and make adjustments otherwise. But right. Yeah. Actually, that's a very good point. Yeah. So in this workflow, we're doing kind of an open loop trajectory. So offline, we're creating the trajectory and putting it into the robot. But in the actual robot, it might not be actually following the trajectory. And this this could be off. 
So yeah. in the real world scenarios, you'll be using the actual feedbacks and the sensor readings to uh, make the correction. I see. So this works fine. Now. Right now, you, we're just kind of offsetting the positions of the feet right. because we're moving in a straight line. The feet are always just going to step down completely parallel to, to the ground in the walking direction. Right. But if you had a curved trajectory, then your feet, you also want them to kind of step along the curvature of the trajectory. Right. So with this, the, or with the whole planning process, you also mm -hmm. would need to take care of that as well. Like, so not just position, right. but orientation of the feet. Right. So that is also a good point. You can also change the, let's say, yaw of the feet around to make the robot turn or you can also maybe say wiggle your ankle pitch or roll a little bit to make sure you're not falling to the disturbance so i mean regardless of how you then plan or react to those footsteps then now we finally have basically the the commands that we're going to send to the feet of, of the robot relative to the torso right so the, the last step is finally to solve that inverse kinematics right so yeah so once we have the trajectory of the feet we want to find the trajectory of the joints. And using the inverse kinematics, you can do that. Over here, I just want to visualize how the joints are moving. And also, this will be a good point to check if the trajectories are working as expected. Yeah. Then, if we kind of scroll down, you ended up using the rigid body tree from Robotic System Toolbox, along with the DH parameter table for your robot. What, what robot are you using again? We are using the same kinematic structure as the Hubel in this okay. case. Actually, a lot of humanoid robots have similar kinematic structure, so this can be also useful for other cases. Yeah. So in your case, we kind of put together this, uh, or we already had the DH parameter table, and we just created a bunch of bodies and joints and put them together. But if you have your own robot kinematics defined, or whether it be in a URDF file or a CAD model, there are ways to get them into MATLAB. Right. So yeah, so in that case, we are using the analytical solution of the inverse kinematics, but uh, of course, you could have different kinematic structure. So in that case, you want to solve your own, or you could use one of the solvers that we have. And in this case, you could use analytical because this is, each leg is six degrees of freedom, and the, the math is kind of set up so that, well, we found the solution online, and we're able to implement it in MATLAB. Right. So I think we have this somewhere in here, and I believe in this function, right? Right, in the inverse. So if we kind of go and look at it, then here is where we convert from, you know, whatever desired transform we have for the for the foot to, you know, all the joint angles. And then as we scroll down to the bottom, we then put together the angles theta 1 through theta 6. Right. Um, so as you were saying, you know, w once you have robots that have more complicated kinematic structures, especially if they have more degrees of freedom or you have some constraints that you need to take care of, it, you might need to explore an optimization-based solution too, right? Right. So I think uh, in that case, the inverse kinematic solver will be a good way to go. But I also do want to point out that although the solvers or optimization techniques will be better for structures that have more links, or in cases where you want to define the constraints, it will be better for that. But it is going to be slower than the analytical solution. Yeah, exactly. So be ready to make that decision depending on what you're doing. So yeah, let's run through and see if our joints after following the inverse kinematic solution, can actually follow the trajectory. So then here you see we're first starting to slump down to our desired height of 0.68, and then we're going to take that first half step, and then the following steps are just going to keep following that right. that walking pattern. Um, and you'll see a little bit of sway from left to right because you're trying to, to keep that center of mass regulated. And what you were talking about, too, with the orientation of the feet, in this case, our feet are always normal to the ground, so there is always a kind of the red or the, the x-axis line of the foot that's always pointing down. So actually, we are now at the point, since now we have the trajectories all ready to go, and we also checked if the kinematics are working as, as expected, we, can, we are going to put it in the, in the model and see how it behaves in the simulation. Okay, so let's open up the walking robot LIPM model. So now we're moving over to a Simulink model that is going to basically represent the entire 3D rigid body dynamics of the robot, including uh, contact forces. So we're using the Simscape multibody spatial contact capabilities to see how that walking happens right. in a dynamic setting. Right, right. So what this model does is it's taking your trajectories, this is in the local frame, right, of the feet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. running them through the inverse kinematics, mm -hmm which we're just calling the same uh, MATLAB functions that, that were created before. Right. 
And then those joint commands are then being passed into kind of a low-level joint controller, and then finally to the walking robot dynamics itself that we that we have here. Right. So let's run this and see how it looks. All right. So what we want to see here is whether the model was actually good enough for the actual robot to follow. So even if it works in the model, it might not work in the actual robot because there is going to be a discrepancy between the, the pendulum and the actual robot. Over here, there could be another guess and check in the entire workflow where you try different, perhaps different walking control or different height or different swing height or whatever parameters you can try to see if it's working in the actual robot. And then I think the other thing besides guessing and checking on the open loop is if we kind of back up to the model, this is still the, you know, the open loop trajectory input, but in reality, maybe here you're going to have a kind of a higher level reference that says, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you want to move your robot in a particular velocity and then right. you, you have something that's kind of taking the measurements from the, right. the feet or the torso closing the loop, reacting to disturbances, and right. so on. Actually, that is a very good point. So we can see that we're only using the open loop trajectory, but in reality, you can you also want to close the loop on that higher level to to find what the next foot position has yeah. to be or how fast your next foot position has to be. Yeah. So I'm thinking of it kind of like from a soccer robot perspective. Like You're not always going to walk forward, right? Like sometimes you might see that your the ball is to the left of your field of view, so then all of a sudden you need to kind of change your motion to go, turn to the left and then, or maybe you're trying to just spin around in place scanning for something. And with things like the capture point calculations that we spoke about before, that's kind of how you would start converting down those higher level commands into something low level for the feet, right? Right. So those are, you know, one of the very good co controllers out there. You could try different things to find the right foot position and the right timing. All right. So thank you for running through that, those examples. I think that's a very interesting starting point for people. Uh, there is, of course, more that you need to think about. So we've got a couple of key takeaways uh, for you to walk away with. Yes. The first key takeaway is that we are using a simpler model to make the robot follow that model. Yeah. So the actual dynamics of the robot will be different. It will be, it will be more complicated and harder to model it. But we're using the pendulum to plan the walking trajectory first, rather than starting with the detailed actual physical model. Because right. then there's too many moving parts that you need to control at the same time, right? Right, yeah. right. It's going to be really hard. Yeah. In terms of the, the pendulum, uh, we really have to think about where to put the next feet, so the next base of the pendulum. Yeah. But uh, for the actual model, it'll be, it'll be harder to think about it. And then on top of that, so once you start adding detail, then the, the next portion is, okay, so you need to go from that foot motion or that body motion to the motion of the joints. And to, to do this inverse kinematics problem, you can solve it either analytically or with optimization. So recall that you chose analytical for this mm -hmm. case. Yes, it would be better if we had the analytical solution, but the analytical solution can be much more difficult to, to derive. Once you do have it, it will be faster instead of the optimization technique. Because for the optimization technique, each solution is going to try multiple times to reach the solution of the inverse kinematics. But in case of more links than the degrees of freedom, it might be better to use the optimization technique, which we provide with the robotic system toolboxes. And then the last thing has to do with, okay, so for this whole set of examples, we showed an open loop walking pattern, but in reality, you're going to disturb the robot, there's going to be a lot of noise. So we, <laughs> we did simplify things a lot. <laughs> in this case, we generated the trajectory offline and use it as the reference point for the robot. In the real case scenario, that would not be the case. You would be using the actual sensor feedback to uh, maybe change your next foot position, or timing of the next foot position. Maybe you can move your torso around, or you could try to move your, wiggle your ankles around. Yeah. So there's a lot of things you can do that, that is still not there yet. And I think that's why in our last simulation, even though the robot didn't fall, it kind of veered off to the side. Oh yes. If you would right. normally correct for that. Right. So in other words, start with these examples, but there is of course a lot more work to do. Oh yes. <laughs> So thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions or want to know more, check out our resources below. You can download all the files using this video from the file exchange. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks.